we are able to overcome incredible problems and survive them all. And we also are able to live with a future which has not even happened. There are two kinds of stories in this world. There's a story which took place and there's another story which has not yet taken place. But both are true. If you have the imagination what that means. That's exactly the difference between Rome, between Caesarea on one side and Jerusalem, Jerusalem on the other side. Because Caesarea can't work with this. You are violating the laws of history. You are violating the normal way how we look into existence, human existence. You are every time not there when we come in and we say, ah, here is the Jew and the Jew is not there. We pay an enormous price for this, no doubt, but we survive. Roman, the Romans, Western civilization, the way of looking, let's call it for a moment, for the lack of a better word, the academic way of looking in Jewish history will break down because it suddenly has to realize one thing, that Jews have been doing things which are completely unacademic by violating the very rules which normally history holds by. And as I said before, that irritates tremendously because the moment that you have something in front of you and people do strange things outside the box, people get irritated. If you want to understand today why it is that we have so many media against us, why people are telling stories about the Israeli army which are not true, where all sorts of things are being said which have got absolutely no base in reality at all, I served myself in the Israeli army, then this is because we irritate. The very existence of the state of Israel irritates because whoever had the good spa to come back 2000 years later? Who dares to do something like that? Not a Roman in this world will permit us to do this. That is what irritated Toynbee, which has irritated many historians. So we live in a strange world, mourning, consolation, past, future, exile, redemption. You know what that means? And again, we may not like that, and I'm not sure I like that. But when we understand what's going on with us, and why we are able to survive all that, what we have survived, then we realize that we are, forgive me for using that word, a normal. I don't want to use the word abnormal. But we are definitely a normal. Because normality doesn't permit what happened to us. By normality, that can't be a state of Israel. By normality, you can't be Jewish. Because assimilation sets in once you have lost your country. And when you have lost many also things, which are the very basis and the very foundations on which a nation stands. So here it is. We are violating history, the laws of history. And by the way, we did something else as well. And that is that we had an enormous influence out of all proportion on Western civilization. Today, Every year I get um, a list of all the Nobel Prize winners. The amount of Jews on that list is completely out of proportion. Some of them will deny that they are Jewish, but their names give them away. We should never be mentioned in the Nobel Prize prizes. We are much too small for that. We are such a small percentage, half a percentage, even less than that. We are such a little tribe of people running around here in this world, in this little country called Israel, which you nearly can't find on the map, unless you use magnifying glasses. And you produce people which have done the greatest of things. We gave the world the Bible. We gave the world the New Testament. You know what, it's perhaps good that I say this at this hour, a few minutes before 12. We gave them Jesus. 
We also thought about the reason why the non-Jewish world today considers this in a moment, the next year. You know why that is? Do you know what Christmas is? Do I have to tell you that as a rabbi? <laughs> Christmas is the day on which Jesus was born. At least that's the official reading. And New Year is the day on which he got a Brit Milah, when he was circumcised. When tonight, in a few minutes, the whole world will take a glass of wine in their hands. What they are really doing is this. They are saying, we are celebrating the circumcision of a Jew. <laughs> One little Jewish boy who got the whole world going for him. I tell you one thing, forgive me for saying this. No Gentile will ever pull this off. <laughs> they don't even realize this anymore because the historical perspective of what it originally was, and we shall not go into the academic side of it, the fact is that is, this is the official reading. The circumcision of one Jew. Jesus, who turned the whole world over with what? Basically with Jewish teachings. Jesus was was not so much a person who broke away from the Jewish tradition, it was more Paul, his disciple, who did that, who created the church. But this is about the Jewish boy. My dear friends, that's terribly irritating. If the world starts to understand that they are celebrating the circumcision, the Brit Milah, one Jew, I don't know what they would think now. If they will continue to raise their glasses, and drink some wine at 12 o'clock. We have made contributions left and right. Not only that we gave them religion, monotheism, the Bible, the New Testament, and obviously out of that New Testament the Islam came about, or better out of the Old Testament. Then afterwards when we secularized, we gave them Freud, we gave them Einstein, we gave them loads of other people, and don't misunderstand me, obviously there are many very genius non-Jews around into this world, I'm only saying one thing, which is clear as it can be. The amount of great people we produced is out of proportion compared to the amount of people we are. There's an eternal I'm going to use another word now, an eternal otherness with the Jews. There is something about these Jews which, and that is a lot to do with anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is basically a response to this otherness of the Jew that you can't get him in a box. And then he becomes dangerous. It's like, as one somebody once wrote, it is like, the Jew, don't get too close to him because he has got a disease. And you know what the disease is? Survival. There's something strange about this person. Let's keep away from him. And then, one of the most marvelous things which happened to you and our, me in our days is when the Jews indeed came home to their country in 1948. When? Three years after the Holocaust. When? After we lost six million of our members. When? At the wrong moment. You lose six, six million people, of which nearly two million children, and then you say, you know what, let's go home. You want to go home? There's nearly nobody anymore to go home. And where do you want to go? We want to go to the Middle East. Why do you want to go to the Middle East? That's our country, Israel. Well, that's the wrong place now. Why? Because you have an enormous amount of people who don't want you there. And they're going to make you trouble left and right till the end, and you will have war after war. And you probably remember, for those who are a little bit interested in Zionist history, you know that at a certain moment Theodor Herzl even nearly gave up on Israel and said, you know what, let's go to Uganda. And most Jews said, very secular Jews most of the time, no way if we are going home. There is only one home, Israel. Which is in itself a very strange thing. 
You want to go home to something of a long time ago where you haven't lived, your grandparents haven't lived there, your great-grandparents have lived there. So what do you want 